We live in a culture that is so hyper stimulated all the time and our nervous systems get used to that pace. So as uncomfortable and as dis destructive as that is, we also get uncomfortable when that's the pace we're used to and then we try to slow down. I think not only can there be, you know, productivity shaming stuff that comes up like, I'm a waste of space, I'm not doing anything productive, um, but also just it's uncomfortable because we're not used to that slower pace. And it's like, we start to get that like crawl out of your skin feeling. And, and that's why we're like, oh my God, I can't be just watching a movie without being on my phone. I've got to do both. And so we almost have to retrain and recalibrate our brain and our nervous system to be able to tolerate that lower stimulus kind of pace. Hey friends, I'm your host, Anya Smith. This episode is a must listen for anyone ready to break free from the hustle and truly honor their ambition. We're talking about mastering compassionate self-discipline to achieve your dreams without the burnout. You will learn how to spark magnetic confidence and move confidently towards your goals, all while maintaining joy and reducing stress. Our special guest is a master at guiding high achievers to vibrant success and meaningful personal growth. Get ready for enriching insights from Valerie Martin, your guide towards a fulfilling journey of success and self-discovery. Valerie, so excited to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Oh my gosh, I'm so happy to be here. And you are the best hype person. I'm like, can I, I'm just going to listen back to that at like beginning of every day. Like I'm excited about this conversation now. <laughs> I am excited as well. Like when I met you, you just have like this dynamic presence. I love the work that you're doing. So like, let's just dive, let's just dive right let's into it. Let's do it. it. And so we talked about fast paced world, like it's all about us. And it's something I personally struggle with. And you have this term called compassion, self-discipline, and this is gaining traction. So can you explain what the heck does that mean to be, have compassion, self-discipline for ourselves? Yeah, it's a, uh, it's an interesting idea and it's discipline. Generally speaking, it's kind of like a harsh term, right? Especially if we think of it in the sense of the verb. Um, in yeah. fact, I even just recently interviewed past right off track guest, Jason Shen on my podcast. He, he kind of did a, a neat post about anti-discipline yeah. that we talked about in that conversation. And so like, yeah, the, the, the idea of discipline can feel very harsh and unforgiving and rigid and all the things. And yet there is a form of discipline. I think of more, you know, the, the noun of like being like reliable and doing the things that we say we want to do right for ourselves and for each other and that commitment and follow through. And I truly do believe that that is a, a skill set that is atrophying um, more and more in our modern culture. And so uh, of course the crack the whip on yourself approach doesn't tend to work well in the long term. A shame based approach doesn't really work great. Um, or if it does, it comes with a serious cost. So I love the idea of can we marry both of these things of self compassion and self discipline. And I absolutely believe from my own experience and how I work with clients that there is a way of doing that. Oh, beautifully put And now diving into this. So, so many of us, it's like a pandemic of rushness. And there's almost even like a culture of like hustle and like, oh, who is more busy? Who is mm. more rushed? Um, but what is the alternative to that? Like how the heck do we actually explore something different and still achieve, quote unquote, everything we want? Sure. I definitely am uh, of the camp that I, I am not anti-hustle. I think there is a time and a place. And I think that actually I was, uh, I, you'll, you'll find that I often reference other things. That's just part of uh, my strengths finder. Number one is input. I'm always collecting things and, sh you know, spreading ideas. So I actually just this morning was listening to a fantastic conversation, um, on Tim Ferriss's podcast with Cal Newport, who I'm such a big fan of his. And, and he talks about how, we sort of the reaction to modern burnout is this like anti-work culture that's developing with, you know, quiet quitting and how little can I do and this like adversarial relationship with work. And as much as uh, sure we can, you know, for another day soapbox about the problems with late stage capitalism, but <laughs> it's, we don't need to be anti hard work, right? Like if, especially if it's something that that matters to you, something that makes you come alive. Like we can all be moving more in that direction, hopefully. But um, 
we do need to embrace some grit and some willingness to do hard work. Uh, but obviously, if we're doing that in a way that is completely depleting ourselves and, and uh, at the expense of our well-being, that is not the way to do it. <laughs> and so now we talked about seem like two opposite spectrums, right? Where you can have this compassion and discipline or you can either be rushing really hard or like, actually mm -hmm. compassion and discipline is in the middle, let's say. Um, and on one end, it's like burnout, like we're working really hard, doing all things. And the other thing is like, I'm just like, why? <laughs> like maybe the, the opposite, like I'm just going to do anything. It doesn't matter. So how do people find that way to get closer to the middle if they're on either yeah. side? So first of all, I think like the kind of the classic find your why it can be important. But with that, uh, it doesn't mean that you have to have some grandiose purpose where you're like, everything I do in my entire week is aligned with my large purpose and vision for the world. Like, it's not necessarily that because people are different. And for some people, they do want or need to feel a deeper sense of meaning and connection in what they do for, you know, 30, 40, 50 hours a week um, or for a paycheck. Other people are able to find that sense of purpose and meaning outside of their primary work. And then they look at work as like, this is a thing I'm good at and I show up and I, you know, get paid and it allows me to live this wonderful life. So I think it's regardless if your why is tied to your, the, the content of your work isn't so important. But having some sense of what your why, what your meaning, what your what makes you come alive, and how are the things that you're doing enabling you to step into that aliveness? So I think that's a really important piece. And then also just cultivating the uh, the grit and the ability to talk nicely to yourself, right? Um, because grit without uh, self-kindness is just going to be harsh. Um, mm -hmm. So it really is kind of two complementary skill sets. And of course, we can go deep into one or both of those things, but it really is like a willingness to go, okay, if, if I struggle more with the discipline side or I struggle more with the compassion side, or maybe I feel like I struggle with both, mm -hmm. where can I identify sort of the deficits that I need to work on developing these skills? That's beautiful. You know what it makes me think about? I recently was reading a book called Rushing Women Syndrome. I don't know if you've mm -hmm. heard about it. Mm -mm. And she talks about the effect on women that rushing has Oof. and talk about like, cortisol spikes. And it's something like, oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. Probably not great for me. At the same time, like when I hear like, oh, just slow down or be present or yes. be, I hear it. I'm like, I have a really hard time still doing that. And this really made me think about like, well, actually like it is really having a huge effect man like why the heck am i doing this from like a physiological psychological standpoint and it made me realize that the core part of it is like i don't um well i put other people's needs in front of me easy but like, i don't <laughs> believe i'm worthy of enjoying the moment mm. you know like just like being here like when you slow down and have nothing pushing you you know telling you what to do or you don't have a next task then you have to just confront being, right? Or just like do, filling up your time with something that's not externally validating. So it was really interesting yeah. for me how it was like just this realization like I can enjoy the moment. I'm worthy of like also setting mm. boundaries for myself and like really just enjoying. Um, and that was something that helped me kind of find that balance. And like I have this job that I really love. Well, I created this job that I really love and it feels purposeful, but I was doing too much. Right. So mm -hmm. it's very easy to somebody who like finds something that they even enjoy. And again, they caught up in these old habits of rushing or doing too much. And that space of exploration, I think, helps us find that middle. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there's so much good stuff in all of that. And I think that it is possible to have a, a life that is quite full without being rushing or be feeling busy, busy, busy all the time. Right. Um, and, and there are some excellent examples of, you know, people in different fields who I feel like, uh, do that well. I mean, Cal Newport is one example, like he, he's extremely prolific. It's a lot done. And yet he is not someone who's like rushing around or doing, you know, busy work. Right. Um, and so it is sort of antithetical to the way that our, uh, modern culture is set up is you, you are going to fall into the current of, that being your pace, if you're not really intentional about 
doing otherwise. So that's kind of my aim is that um, I do want to have a pretty full life. I do need some white space. I think we all need some white space, but can I have a full life without rushing? Because I absolutely agree that there's something to that. And, and also the fact that we live in a culture that is so hyper stimulated mm -hmm. all the time and our nervous systems get used to that pace. Mm -hmm. So as uncomfortable and as dis destructive as that is, it's kind of like you said, we also get uncomfortable when that's the pace we're used to. And then we try to slow down. I think not only can there be, you know, productivity shaming stuff that comes up, like I'm a waste of space. I'm not doing anything productive. Um, but also just it's uncomfortable because we're not used to that slower pace. And it's like, we start to get that like crawl out of your skin feeling. And, and that's why we're like, oh my God, I can't be just watching a movie without being on my phone. I've got to do both. And so we almost have to retrain and recalibrate our brain and our nervous system to be able to tolerate that lower stimulus kind of pace. Absolutely. And that makes me think about like, we're physically not quite created for this environment that's massively accelerating, you know, the pace. Of yes. It. And so like our innate system isn't quite ready to uh, upgrade all the time time. So there's kind of this balance and that creates, you know, what we see around us, a lot of like mental health issues and people struggling, imploding a lot of times where they visually, you know, on Instagram, everything looks fantastic. But a lot yeah. of time there's a lot of inner guilt and challenges. So what are maybe some of the top mental health issues that you're seeing happening and how can like compassionate self discipline help with some of those? Yeah. Oh my gosh. So much because, um, as you know, in addition to being a coach, I'm, I'm a clinician, a uh, licensed therapist, and, and I lead a team of clinicians here and it's, uh, so much of our mental health issues. It's just, it's, it's impossible for us to be able to separate like how much of this is sort of like quote unquote organic mental health, whether that's, you know, hereditary stuff or just sort of in ingrained organic to the brain issues versus what is more culture bound or habitually now wired after a lot of repeated behaviors um, impacted by the environment. It's impossible for us to untangle all of those variables. And so I don't know how much of the increase in things like, you know, teenage mental health issues for of all kinds, depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation and self-harm behaviors like we know statistically those numbers have shot way up. Um, but, you know, even among adults, too. It's, it's tricky because it's like there's increasing cultural awareness of things like neurodiversity and the fact that like, gosh, maybe we've always had more neurodiversity than it had been acknowledged previously. So it's not just to say that modern culture has just created all of this adult, di adult onset ADHD or adult diagnosed ADHD, but I do think that there is a relationship between those things and that the pace of our culture, our relationship with devices, um, which in the field, we talk about neuroplasticity and how, you know, we can actually heal the brain by doing certain practices that can increase, uh, you know, memory or whatever other thing in the brain that we're wanting to target, even positive self-talk. Right. Um, but I think there's not enough conversation around the, the flip side of neuroplasticity of how much have we changed the actual structures of our brains with the relationship with technology and devices that we have had over the last, you know, 15 years or so. Um, Cause I know personally, I would not have met criteria for traditional ADHD, which is symptom symptoms that were present before the age of 12. But I had my first uh, phone at 14 years old back in like 2000. Uh, we had, mm. uh, you know, a computer in our household from the time I was about 10. And so absolutely, I, I know that my brain has been impacted by my relationship with technology and, I, and you know, I'm far from the only one. So I think that it's really, it's challenging. And um, Nir Eyal in uh, Indistractable, his book, uh, Johan Hari in Stolen Focus, it's really interesting the different approaches, like a lot of these issues uh, that we talk about in modern society. It's like how much is on the individual to change their own behavior and monitor that and how much is on society and, you know, 
regulating companies and the attention economy to do better. And so these different, you know, authors and experts kind of take different perspectives on those. I think it's got to be both, but it's certainly uh, if it's if it's left fully up to the individual, I think we're really not set up well for, for the coming generations. It's interesting. Uh, it reminds me that in the book, one of the books I've been reading by Dan Sullivan and Ed Hardy, excuse me, Benjamin Hardy, um, they talk about how a lot of the suicide trends, especially in younger adults, are mm-hmm. not in people who are not high achievers, but like actually people who are very high achieving. That the data shows is the people who are really high achieving are usually struggling the most because of the expectations, the pressure, whatnot. And for this podcast, a lot of the audience is this high achieving group, you know, entrepreneurs, people who are doing a lot of things. What advice, what practical advice would you give somebody who does have that mindset? Like I want to achieve a lot. I want to make this world amazing. That still helps them have that mental hygiene where they're still compassionately being disciplined towards themselves. Yep. I think people really have to learn to develop psychological flexibility um, and that kind of like self-kindness, like, are you talking to yourself the way that you would talk to a friend? Uh, and again, that's not saying like, just be stagnant, just be complacent, just, you know, whatever, like who cares if you get that promotion that you're looking for, if your company succeeds. Um, but it, it is recognizing that a lot of times high achievers have gotten there through a bit of brute forcing and perhaps a lot of like having very high standards for themselves. And it's one thing to have high standards and it's another to rigidly and perfectionistically hold yourself to those or punish yourself when you don't meet them, right? As opposed to looking at like, oh gosh, ouch, that that stings. I really was hoping that that was gonna work. What can I learn from that? How can I um, take the lesson and not be a jerk to myself about it, even if I wasn't super happy or proud about how that turned out? And yeah, it's I, I talk about like the adult gifted child syndrome of like we what got you here in terms of you know what made you successful as a young person in school or in your sport or in your you know field of expertise may not be the thing that gets you there because if it crushes your spirit it's not going to you mentioned one what could be the, the signs that somebody's like you know what this is really not working for me like what could be some of those internal signs where maybe externally you're still functioning but you feel something amiss inside what could people look out for to be like mm, maybe sure. I need some reflection Yeah. Well, one would definitely be (laughs) self-loathing and it's like, it's sneaky. I talk about this in my, my private podcast series, which is called you are mother effing enough. Um, that thank you. Uh, that in my own experience of dealing with shame, I actually didn't realize how much shame I was carrying around because it would be, it wasn't just like the constant barrage of like, God, you're an idiot but it was a lot of harshness on myself when things, you know, I wouldn't succeed at something as quickly as I thought that I should and comparison with other people who are just better at this than me. And, and, and so my shame got very kind of slippery and sneaky. Um, but it was still, it still was self-loathing. Um, even if it was kind of a little bit cloaked. So I think we really have to look honestly at our relationship with ourselves, how we talk to ourselves, how we treat ourselves. Um, again, like the the standards we hold ourselves to, are they human scaled? Are they realistic? Um, when we don't meet them, how do we treat ourselves? And, and Valerie, you shared all this amazing advice and we talked about how achievers, but can you share with us how the heck did you get into this space and decide to help people kind of have this inner reflection and kind of a more... Um, balanced and healing way to be out in the world. Sure. I mean, I think uh, like a lot of people who end up in the healing spaces, the helping professions, we get here by our own suffering. (laughs) And uh, what that suffering has looked like for me, of course, has evolved. Um, And so the things that I most that initially drew me into the field of mental health, thankfully, are not things that I still struggle with anymore. But as I leaned more and more into um, wanting to step more fully into my own potential, that's where I really started to battle with those shame gremlins and demons and just like being so hard on myself. Here was the other part. 
that I wanted to mention in addition to self-loathing is just general sense of discontent and never feeling like you're doing enough, that you are enough, that you have enough, right? And and that's where like I say it's sort of like the mind fuck of uh the the intersection of more, less and enough. And uh because I believe that it's very human and to want more for ourselves, especially if like for me in in several years ago of like knowing that I was capable of more and so frustrated that I was not stepping fully into that. So then the shame cycle is, you know, perpetuated, um, you know, wanting less comparison, wanting less uh, busyness, chaos, all of that stuff that, that we're wanting to sort of like reclaim. So we want more, we want less, we want to feel like we're enough and sometimes those things can feel very contradictory. So I became really passionate about acknowledging that all of those wanting more or less and wanting to feel enough now can actually all coexist at the same time. And in fact, if we don't allow them to, we're not actually getting a complete picture of what's going on, especially for high achievers. Absolutely. And it makes me like the stark reminder is that people think success is so much about what we do, right? And like the actions that we take. And we often forget this really success is mental. Yeah. Meaning that a lot of times like we will give up much faster based on how we feel inside, like those doubts, those fears, those like just constant burnout, you know, those stressors that are internal much more than they are external a lot of times. And so I'm grateful for the conversations and the work that you're doing because it's a good reminder that we have to start or take space or create space within to have that lasting life success that we want to have. And Absolutely. Do all the work, right? Yep. Because we, we know, we see examples, unfortunately, all the time of people who have all of the external success and are miserable internally. So if that's ever what you're feeling like, like you're like, oh, on paper, my life looks really good, but you know, I feel empty or I don't feel fully alive, or I just feel kind of like I'm always a cat chasing my tail and I'm never going to get there. Um, that to me is a big sign that working on, you know, the compassionate self-discipline is going to really benefit you. And especially, um, exploring what satisfaction and contentment look like because psychologically and just how we are wired, <laughs> we're not really that well wired to feel content or satisfied. We're sort of these teleological goal oriented beings that are like, okay, next thing, next thing. And while that's great, we want to honor that ambition and that potential. If we're not also helping our brains step into an experience of satisfaction and contentment, it's not just going to automatically mm -hmm. happen for most of us. Oh, beautiful. We have that strong negativity bias, right? Where we're always mm -hmm. like really fearing losing and something negative happen. And so even like the stuff of appreciating positive things and taking space for that, you know, it can be easily ignored. And yet it, yep. your point is so very, very helpful. And okay, so we um, say so, so we have somebody, um, let me rephrase that. What maybe practical steps do you have? So somebody's listening is, okay, this is, sounds interesting. I need more of that in my life. Is there a few things that they could start doing now to take the journey on this path, on this path. Sure. Well, other than connecting with all my stuff that I have, which I know we'll share about, since yes. this is my personal obsession to yeah. talk about all these things, but places that I think you could start is like, you know, like I said earlier, to define what your, what your why is of what matters to you about the, the things that you're aiming for. Do you feel like you are adequately honoring your ambition? So if you feel like you've gotten so, sort of discouraged and frustrated and have kind of backed off from it, that's not going to feel good. You're not honoring yourself. So do you feel like you're really owning and honoring the things that you desire and want? Um, and then setting yourself up for success in terms of how you're starting to move toward those things. And that's like the little kind of atomic habits uh, way of working toward that discipline, right? Because so, so often we attempt to, you know, we, we say, okay, well, this is the thing I want. So this is how I'm going to get there. And I'm just going to go. And if we don't have a strong plan, maybe support accountability tools, systems, I always say willpower and intention are insufficient. Um, we can want something pretty badly. We can have the why, but if that's all, and we're not actually setting up a strong plan for how we are going to get there, 
then we're probably going to be set up for failure. And then we're going to be like, see, I can't do it. And it's just going to feed into that sort of story um, as opposed to looking at what pieces, what variables might have been missing. It sounds like you're creating that self-fulfilling prophecy. Like, oh yeah, I, I didn't think I could do it and I didn't do it. And that erodes our self-trust because it starts to create this sort of identity of like, yep, of course, that's just like me to let myself down again. Like, no, we build self-trust by keeping our word to ourselves, just like we would to someone else that we care about. Well, I think the compassion part, what I love about it is that when we're compassionate, we can actually go in deeper into yep. ourselves with compassion and look at things honestly. Compassion doesn't make you weak. It gives you resilience because you can give yourself the grace to reflect on things, how they are without judgment that makes you close up. So I love that. Yeah, exactly. And you just had a cool rebrand, but where can people find you for all of your amazing resources? Yes. Um, you can find me at honoryourspark.com on Instagram and pretty much everywhere else at honor your spark. And that is also the name of my podcast. I love it. And you are fantastic. You have so much knowledge to share from your guests, from books, from your own experience. So please check out Valerie's resources, like wherever you are getting your information, wherever you get your inspiration, Valerie would be another awesome source for that. And here, Valerie, we wrap up with three rapid fire questions. So whenever you're ready, let me know. I'm ready. Let's do it. Okay. A favorite book that changed your perspective on success? Ooh. Actually, you mentioned um, Dan, uh, Ben Benjamin Hardy and Dan Sullivan yes. earlier, and I don't know which book of theirs that you're reading right now, but The Gap in the Game oh, was yes. huge for me. I'm obsessed yes. with it. I have, yes, I love that so much. And if anyone's listening, I do have like a mini solo episode that I of the podcast that I did on The Gap in the Game that people can check out, but read the book. It's so good. Love it. Okay. Favorite way to unwind after... Favorite way to unwind after a busy day? Uh, having dinner with my husband while we watch one of our shows. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Okay. And last but not least, in the positive context, going off track is? Woo! Going off track is being willing to follow your curiosity and zig and zag, even if it's a little unorthodox of recognizing that it may not make sense at the moment, but all of those points, all of those experiences, mm -hmm. as you maybe go off track are going to at some point make sense or play into your uniqueness and what you bring to the table in whatever you're doing. Beautiful. Thank you so much. And just to all of our listeners, I hope that you took something away wherever you are in your journey. Is there a point where you can find a little bit more of that compassion for yourself or a little more discipline? Or you find like, hey, I am like on this journey. I have this, but there's some more work I could be doing. But I hope this gives you a point of reflection where you are right now and gives you a sense like, you know, I can be doing I can be approaching this in maybe a new way or I have some new resources that I, that I learned about. So if any new questions came up, please share it with us. If this episode was helpful, please share it with a friend and help them learn as well. And also my last tidbit is that right now uh, I'm excited for March to come, which is when our episode comes out because I'm helping launch and host an accelerator program for entrepreneurs. So if you are somebody who is new in this space or wanting to get onto this road, uh, please check out the link in the description and be part of the small group environment where we're helping everybody succeed, expand their mindset, um, also get very clear on their limits and then have some social media strategy and growth strategy to help create that balance effect. And Valerie, thank you so much for your time. It was such a blast and I learned so much from you and I hope that our listeners will too. And thank you again. It was an honor. Thanks so much. My pleasure. Take care.